Hello everyone, welcome back to the Google Book Search Settlement Workshop here at the Berkman Center. Um, we are uh, extremely lucky that in what may be his first presentation at Harvard, um, back in uh, this environment, um, Lawrence Lessig is going to um, try out some new stuff uh, here, which is extremely exciting. I had a, um, a kick of that little kind of kick that one gets when I saw his name tag back there, which said Lawrence Lessig, Harvard Law School. Um, for several years now, it has said Stanford Law School, and um, I just couldn't be happier. I think there's no introduction needed, but Larry, we're just delighted that you're willing to do this, and welcome home. Thank you, and thanks, John. <clears throat> so I have uh, two observations and a story. On the way to an argument, that will be basically what Siva said. But I'm going to say it again, because what Siva said, I think, is very important for all of us to focus. OK, so here's the observation, first observation. <clears throat> Tigers, as cubs, are extremely cute. <laughs> People can look at tigers as cubs and actually kind of confuse them with kittens. <laughs> you look at a tiger as a cub and you say it walks like a kitten, and talks like a kitten, but the important thing for parents to remember is it is not a kitten. <laughs> tigers have a very different nature to them. That's not a child that's been consumed by this tiger here. They have very different nature to them. And however cute, however sweet, however wonderful as kittens, we have to, as mature sorts, remember that nature. That's the first observation. Here's the second. Extraordinary thing about published books is that we basically have access to all of them. You think about old books, many old books everywhere. We have access to them for free. And I don't mean free as in free speech. I mean here free as in free beer, the cornerstone idea of the library, guaranteeing access to all published books for free. If they're old, before 1923 in the United States, they're in the public domain, and we can copy them and distribute them as much as we want. If they're new, because the physical copy itself, when distributed, doesn't copy itself, it doesn't trigger copyright law, and therefore is capable of being moved about the world without fear of the regulation of copyright law. It's also free. Extraordinary fact that this cornerstone of our culture is guaranteed to be free by this architecture of regulation we've erected around it. That's a second observation. Here's the story. This man is Charles Guggenheim one of the most important 20th century documentarians. He made an extraordinary number of documentaries. One of the most poignant and famous, perhaps, is a documentary he made in just a couple months, sorry, that's his son, a couple months after RFK was assassinated, a documentary that was played at the Democratic National Convention in 1968 and played only there in public form. His son, as I said, is Davis Guggenheim, who produced The Inconvenient Truth with Al Gore. But I want to focus on his daughter, Grace Guggenheim, who is also a filmmaker, but who has spent literally 20 years of her life on one project. And that is to clear the rights to enable her father's documentaries to be made accessible on DVD. Now, why would it take 20 years to clear the rights to her own father's documentaries to be accessible on DVDs? Well, the style of a documentary in the 1920th uh, century at least was basically to tell a story that would be comprised of a bunch of snippets. So you would say, for example, 60 seconds taken from CBS in your documentary about civil rights in the 1960s. But when you took these snippets, the standard practice was to have a contract or a license. And the first bullet in that license would say something like, all rights you have in this are governed by this license. And this license gives you, for example, five years North American educational use for this content. Which means after five years, if you want to continue to make this work accessible 
make new copies, distribute it, play it on a DVD. You can't do that unless you go back and get permission from everyone who gave you permission initially to build your documentary, which of course means it's impossible to release these documentaries. Now, when these documentaries were being made, people were completely oblivious to this fact. They didn't think about it. That there's a standard way in which you're engaging with standard actors like CBS or uh, uh, rights holders of that sort, and they had a standard mentality about what they would do, and it was, we need to license and grant permission for everything, and nobody thought about how access to culture would be different how it would be radically different between the book and the film. Okay, that's the introduction. Here's the argument. You've all heard about this case. This is the Google book search case, which was inspired when this company launched this product, the Google Print, which became Google book search. It's important to remember a little bit about the early stage of this now very long story. Their objective, of course, to Googleize printed books. What would that mean? Well, they had three categories of these books. And if there was about 18 million books they wanted to scan, 9% of those books were books that were in print and in copyright. 16% of those books were books that were in the public domain. Meaning 75% of these books were books that were presumptively under copyright but out of print. Google's plan was to uh, basically do two things. They were going to scan access, they were going to scan everything, and then grant access to these works differentially depending upon their status. So for example, public domain works, they would grant access, you could download, you can now right now download PDF, even their broken PDF versions of public domain books. With respect to uh, that work, you can see, for example, this is an example of a book in the public domain. You get full, complete ability to do with it, um, read it, and uh, copy it as you wish. With respect to works that were presumptively under copyright, you would get at least snippet access. And that meant literally snippets. Looks like this, right? Where you could see a couple words around the search term you had, but that was it. And with respect to works that were in copyright and in print, Google would grant you as much permission as, uh, access as the publishers or authors would allow. So here's a book uh, collected by Justice uh, Judge, could never be Justice Posner, about Justice Holmes, um, where you can read a couple pages around any search term, much better than snippet, but certainly not a public domain work. Now, obviously, as we know here, not everyone loves Google, especially Google Book Search, and that was what inspired this lawsuit, a lack of love for this company and its product. Um, and this, comp this lawsuit had at its core a simple legal claim, that before Google could scan any of these books, they would need to get permission from the copyright owners. Now, of course, that doesn't apply to the 16% that's in the public domain. And it's not actually a burden for the 9% that's in print and uncopyright, because at least we know who those copyright owners are. But for 75% of the books in this library, what that rule would mean is that it's effectively invisible, this knowledge, to this digital library, because of course it's extraordinarily impracticable to clear rights to these works whose owners we can't even identify. So what's inspired this conference, of course, is this settlement that happened last year, a settlement in its crude description which said 20% of all of these works could be available freely because Google has paid for that right. And then anybody can get full access to this free work if they pay for it. The user pays for it and the money gets distributed in a complicated way by a new uh, nonprofit set up to establish that. Left open, explicitly left open, was the question whether the use Google had claimed before was fair use. They continue to maintain it would have been fair use to scan and make accessible at least snippet access. Scanning and snippets then is the core of what was at issue in their uh, concern. And so that was the structure of the deal. And as I have said, my view is there's progress in this deal. Um, 
progress you can visualize like this. Instead of this invisible picture, we get 20% of the invisible works, at least guaranteed to us, at least um, freely. And that's more than what fair use would have granted. And more here is better. And this part of the story, I still believe, and not just because of this access, it's also because at the core of this agreement is the push for what I think is an essential part to the solution here, uh, a registry and a registry committed, at least in pap on paper, to being an open registry to enable access and competing registries to also take advantage of the registry services. And it's a little bit of a Harvard bias here. Um, the, the lawyer who negotiated this was a lawyer who 10 years ago would have been sitting up here fiddling with the technologies to make sure the screen came up. And there's an extraordinary elegance and trickiness elegance to how this uh, was crafted, which as a law professor and a former professor of this lawyer, one can't help but feel a little bit proud at the ingeniousness <laughs> of what Alex accomplished. So statically, I want to say there is value in this agreement. But the part that concerns me increasingly is to think about the dynamic consequences of this agreement. And to think about it in terms that would be familiar to anybody who knows Jamie Boyle's works. To think about the ecology that this agreement produces. And to think about it against the background of the ecology of access today in the physical world, right? An ecology of access that is at its core about books that live in libraries guaranteeing free access to those books. Not 20% access to those books, but free access to the books, meaning you can sit down and read the whole book for free. You can collect 100 books on your table and page, page through these 100 books and keep them for free. That's what the nature of access to our culture has been. And the problem here is that the settlement pushes us towards a radically different kind of ecology. It's a simplification to say that this is actually a 20% rule. If you actually read through this agreement, it's a radically complex formula, radically different depending on the nature of the agreement. So journals have a very different rule than scientific works that are published books. It's all extraordinarily complex. And how much you get access to for free is not anything that anybody without a very uh, weird kind of degree could tell you. And here's my fear. That this agreement with the largest and most important uh, information technology company we've got and the two presumptive rights players here, publishers and authors, moves us down a path where books become documentary films. Well, the ecology of access we have to books in the future is like the ecology of access we have to documentary films today, which means that we don't have access in the traditional sense of guaranteeing we've got access. We've got access that's encumbered by a punch of agreements that don't ever build into their architecture the theme that we must guarantee at some point free access to this culture. We're building in this not so much a digital library, but a digital bookstore. And worse than a digital bookstore, it's a digital bookstore with the freedoms of a library of documentaries, which again, in my view, is no freedom at all. Now again, we get to this point, this problem, because of a similar dynamic that produced the problem of documentaries, an obsessive permission culture. Obsessive culture where people who have control over these objects believe it is in their purpose to regulate through law every bit of access forever. And that culture is produced by the structure of oligopolies that control here. And if we think about how they have produced access to a different bit of our culture, music, there is, of course, a guarantee of access, but there's a tendency against the free access that we have taken for granted in the ecology of knowledge that we have had since the beginning of printing. This agreement seems oblivious to this, and many who are 
involved in this agreement and criticizing this agreement seem oblivious to it. Our attention is focused elsewhere. Where is our attention focused? Well, let's go back to the tiger, to the curse of the cat. Our attention is focused to these entities who don't behave like kittens when we hope they would behave like kittens or the fear that they will not behave like kittens. And we become outraged by their nature when they don't behave like kittens. Me, I'm outraged and I rail against organizations like the Authors Guild, who seem to me not focused on the concern of authors, but focused on the concern of the richest, top 2% of authors, and they write agreements and file lawsuits to guarantee they get the most money they can possibly get, ignoring the way they're destroying the culture of authorship that 98% of authors depend upon. And others in this debate have their own kitten-turned-tiger-like obsession, and Google is the core of it, which is, I think, for the same reason a tiger is constitutionally incapable of, in some sense, leading, leading, uh, living a life that respects this command, right? That is in its ultimate nature. Now, the point, though, is to push that the mature response to this fact about kittens turning into tigers, this fact, uh, is that we don't give our children tiger kittens and we don't trust our culture to kittens that turn into tigers. Right? So we need to recognize here that there are a bunch of hard questions that we can't privatize in this judgment, insanely hard questions here. And not just the questions of competition and privacy. Those are hard enough. But the set of questions I think we haven't begun to frame is these questions about an ecology of access. And think about how we're going to restrike a balance in the digital world that gives us something like the value of the balance that was struck in the physical world, a balance between what I think of as the commercial life of published works and the beyond the commercial life of published works. I'm going to talk about what that it means a little bit more in a second. But in getting to this restrike the balance, I think there's some obvious first steps. The most obvious first steps is when we think about orphans. And my view continues to be that the obvious solution to the problem of orphans is to think about how to return something like a registration system, at least as a maintenance requirement for copyright. It certainly is not. The copyright offices, in my view, one could call this brain dead solution, which would impose a lawyer review process before we got confidence that we had any right to get access to works that were claimed to be orphans. I want you to see the way in which this solution is to documentaryify, if that could be a word, orphan works, in the sense that. It imposes such enormous transaction costs on getting access to orphan works, it guarantees they remain orphans. So we need to move in an obvious way, I think, towards re-understanding how a registration system could clarify those things that need copyright protection from those things that don't and push those things that don't need the system of regulation into the public domain. That's the first step. But there's a whole series of non-obvious second steps here. Questions about how we preserve access to culture without destroying the commercial incentives necessary to produce at least an important chunk of that culture. How we protect these institutions that develop important aspects of our culture, including, not related to copyright, but including, for example, journalism, without protecting particular business models that we've inherited from the 20th century. And I think we need to start this with an extraordinary claim of humility here, that none of us know the answer to this question. We spend all sorts of time in conferences like this focusing on their limits, the limits of, of the corporation. But am I the only academic who's kind of terrified with the idea of academics designing the future of <laughs> our culture? I mean, we both, both of these systems have limits in our ability to understand what's best here. And we need a framework that understands our own limits to facilitate this conversation. And we need a framework to encourage experimentation. And people have said nice things about the Creative Commons project born at this institution um, just about eight years ago. But the objective of this project was to facilitate, as Siva said, this experimentation, to give people an ability to say, to signal which ecology they wanted to be part of. 
Did they want to be part of the commercial Britney Spears ecology, which is pay me for everything you do with my stuff? Or did they want to be part of the uh, ecology that defines universities, where it's give the work in a way that others get access to it and freely share and build upon it? Which did you want? And give people a simple way to say that. Because I think when we thought about this problem eight years ago, we recognized, as I've described before, that these different kinds of lives for cultural production need to live together. So if you think about a book, a really successful book has a life that looks something like this. There's a period of time where there's extraordinary activity around it. It sells lots of copies. And the way the copyright system in the physical world overlapped with that book is that it essentially regulated that book effectively in the initial period. And then after a certain point, when it fell out of print, though in theory the copyright continues to regulate because copyrights as we know are forever, oh wait, I'm sorry, limited times, but um, <laughs> uh, in theory the copyright continued to regulate, but in practice it didn't matter because you could move a physical book around the world without triggering copyright law. So copyright law's objective was to regulate in that narrow window when there was some commercial life for publishing the book. And then after that life, things could move forever free of that cumbersome lawyer-focused system of copyright. The problem in the digital world is that free space disappears because every single thing you do with copyrighted work in a digital environment triggers copyright law in theory because it produces a copy and so this is how the publishers and authors could claim, you scan our books, you need our permission, even though the scan is producing just garbage inside of a digital uh, archive, which is a database. It's that trigger that gives them the claim for complete control. And the question, the balance question is, what do we do to recreate this balance? How do we structure a legal regime to give us both the, the commercial opportunity where that's necessary and the free access where that commercial opportunity is no longer necessary. To do this, of course, the conclusion many of us had a long time ago and spoke quite forcefully, even we academics, was to remake copyright here. Now, that's the hard second steps. That's the end of the argument. Here's how I want to end. I want to end by hijacking this conversation here. Um, but first, I want to point to this guy. Because I'm a little embarrassed. I'm a little bit of a gorophile. I kind of... <laughs> <laughs> enormous respect and admiration for this man. Here's Gore at the TED conference this year. Optimism is sometimes characterized as a belief, an intellectual posture. But as Mahatma Gandhi famously uh, said, you must become the change you wish to see in the world. And the outcome about which we wish to be optimistic is not going to be created by the belief alone, except to the extent that the belief brings about new behavior. But the word behavior is also, I think, sometimes misunderstood in this context. I'm a big advocate of changing the light bulbs and buying hybrids and Tipper and I have put 33 solar panels on our house and dug the geothermal wells and done all of that uh, other stuff. But uh, as important it is, as it is to change the light bulbs, it's more important to change the laws. And when we change our behavior in our, in our daily lives, we sometimes leave out the citizenship part and the democracy part. In order to be optimistic about this, we have to become incredibly active as citizens in our democracy. In order to solve the climate crisis, we have to solve the democracy crisis. Now, what does he mean by the democracy crisis? Right, the democracy crisis is not that we can't count votes. <laughs> we, of course, can't count votes, but that's not the crisis. The democracy crisis is that we don't think of democracy as a tool to solve public problems. And that's the same thing that we're suffering here. I mean, think about environmental policy, which the natural response of people when they're thinking about how to push environmental ends is to go pick at Starbucks, right? Rather than thinking about how do we get the government to actually create the rules to make sure that Starbucks behaves in a way that Starbucks ought to behave. 
And that's increasingly the same response we're having in this cultural environmental policy context, right? This big push to go pick at Google in some sense, to force them to behave. When what we need here is a cultural environmental policy written by coders not like this, or not even coders like these guys, but coders like these people, people who write the code, which is the law. Right? Now, when one says that, I think all of us have this sense, this is a terrifying thought, <laughs> that we depend upon them in order to solve this problem, that we depend upon them to at least ratify the solutions that we've come up I come up with to this problem because they are an essential part of making sure that this set of rules does not get inverted once the kitten becomes a tiger. But the frustration that I have when I listen to this rally that we've got to figure out all of these answers and the sense in which I want to hijack your conference, John and Phil, here, um, is that each area of public policy is filled with people oblivious to the fact that the reason why they are failing is the same reason why everyone else who's trying to change public policy is failing. Right? We live in this kind of post-Obama hangover, I suggest, where I think nine months ago we thought the world was going to be remade. And as we look at health care, which is totally stalled, cap and trade, which is totally gutted, financial reform that hasn't begun to be implemented, all of this which has failed so far, we need to recognize that there is a core reason for these failures. It's a reason that we have to confront this bankrupt or I'd say corrupt institution, not in an old sense of people taking bribes, but an institution that can't help but respond to interests who, because of their financial might, will always be more powerful than the right answer to a problem. Until we solve that problem, and I don't know what the solution would look like, but until we <laughs> solve that problem, until we change this, we won't begin to solve the problem we're talking about here or any number of other fundamental problems which are sinking this democracy now. Thank you very much. Phil, did you want me to answer questions? Yes, or? why don't you, and I'm more than happy to yield some of the time for our next session. Why don't we take 10, 12 minutes at least to get okay, it? Okay, please, sorry. Is that better? Good. No? Yeah. 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 OK. Uh, can I test just for a minute this notion that you put forward that everything used to be free in the print world? And uh, as a, an official of an academic research library, I know that that's you know, far from the truth. There were lots of books that were locked away behind ivy walls. And you might get in if you were really lucky or had a lot of money to pay tuition. Interlibrary loan is pretty broken. There are lots of formats of content that we don't treat like books, music and video, for example. So it was uh, possibly easier if you knew your way around than now, but it wasn't free. There were lots of costs involved in, in collecting those books. There were many books that were never purchased by any library. Yeah, so, um, so first of all, I am talking just about books. I completely agree about music and documentary films. That was the whole point I was making about these other archives of culture which have radically different access rules to pub the published book. And when I said book and I said we, I really meant we, right? We here at Harvard University or people like this. All I'm saying is that we have guaranteed access to facilitate the continued life of these books, right? And, and the simplest way in which that's true is that the copyright expires and it wasn't the convention when you wrote a book 
to get a license to include quotes. Now, it is increasingly the contention, I can't tell you the number of people who, literally, it must at least be a dozen, who have written me and said, I just read your book, Free Culture. May I have permission to quote the following two sentences? <laughs> <laughs> to which the response is, first, did you really read the book, Free Culture? <laughs> and second, Hell no, am I going to give you permission to quote. You have permission by virtue of fair use and conventions around this. And if I'm going to get in the business of giving you permission, it only supports the idea that to do something like this, you need a permission. So thank God we didn't have a system of efficient enforcement in the 18th and 19th centuries that would have made possible the thought that in order to quote, you're going to have to get a license, and the license would govern the life, of, because it has produced an archive of material radically different from documentaries. And that is a crucial value. And all I'm saying is, it, you know, I totally agree we've got unequal access, and you know, that's why I was very supportive of the open access publishing movement, to guarantee that we had equal access to scientific knowledge at least, which we don't, of course, right now. But at least the architecture of regulation built in a limit to the copyright regulation, and we had no overlay of contract that made it impossible for people to, to get access to this crucial part of our culture. So, Larry, maybe a pessimistic follow-up. I tend to agree with you that the root cause is as profound and as widespread as you say it is. But when I, have, when I hear that message in the context of what we're talking about today, whether it's some kind of progress on orphan works that isn't a private settlement through a class action, or whether it's the kind of political movement we were talking about this morning to make it possible for these other digitization efforts to go forward, what optimism, what, what glimmer of hope can you give us that those specific things that we would like to do today or next year uh, have a chance when we have this monster of an umbrella problem hanging over uh, all of it. Right. So the first part of that is, to, again, as I said when I started, um, uh, to emphasize, as Siva said when he started, the extraordinary need for this political work, but to complement that political work with 20% focused on this more fundamental question. So like I, you know, we go around and talk to environmentalists. I don't say give up your work in environmentalism, but give us, you know, like Google has a 20% rule, give us 20% that we can begin to direct against this more fundamental problem. And when you, you know, I think about this hangover point, you think about literally in our field, there have been millions spent to try to get good policy, but in other fields like healthcare policy and uh, environmental policy, there have been millions of dollars spent by people who are trying to reform the system, and it's all for nothing, because it's all going to be short-circuited by this corruption of the system. So, you know, is it, but, but you know, is that, so solving that problem as hard as, uh, you know, as it sounds? And, and part of me, you know, of course, is constitutionally uh, required to be pessimistic, um, and so, you know, I say, of course, it's impossible, but, but actually, this problem is not as hard as other problems that we have solved. Like for example, you know, the nation has struggled with racism you know, explicitly for more than 150 years. Right? This has been a core problem with the uh, United States, explicit policy, how do we deal with racism for 150 years? It is a genuinely difficult problem to solve. Right? It's not just that a law could change it and people's minds would conform to the new view of the law. It takes you know, generations of fighting. And you think about, I always think about the kind of, you know, um, uh, Justice Powell-like person who grows up with norms that say segregation is appropriate and right and has to evolve to the person who begins to understand why the way his father raised him was wrong, right? That's hard. But this problem, like the corruption of our political system through money inside of, this problem, I think, gets a huge chunk of, so much bigger than what Brown or even the Civil Rights Party, with one law, right? And in fact, yesterday, in Washington was the first hearing, a packed room in the Larson uh, Jones bill, um, which would create a kind of public funding system, basically grub stake from the state, and then you can raise as much as you want and $100 contributions or less, that overnight would make it that you couldn't plausibly say that the reason Congress did what Congress did was because of the money. It could have been because they're idiots, because they're too many Republicans, too many Democrats, whatever, but it wasn't the money. And what that does is it invites us back into a political conversation, because most of us,
you know, 88% in my district think uh, money buys results in Congress. Like 20% think a $1,000 contribution buys a result in Congress, right? So in that world, why would you waste your time unless you're the most influential source? Um, so uh, if we could at least take that problem off the table, then we can invite more people into a political conversation. They won't be turned off by the political conversation the way most intelligent people are right now. No. So that's the optimistic story. The pessimistic part about that, though, this is where I think you can push back, is people always talk about you know, public funding proposals as if it's the Congress people who are going to lose. But you know, members of Congress are going to be members of Congress, whether we have public funding or not. Most of them will be the same. They, they can live under the new system. They're not the losers. The real thing to fear here is that there has been produced in the last 15 years an enormously powerful industry inside the Beltway whose whole power is the ability to sell influence. Right? They can sell influence because they basically take money from clients and then they produce money to campaigns and that's the quid pro quo that produces legislative results. If we ever got close to killing that, that beast isn't going to die a quiet death. right? So, you know, we think about how hard it is to fight the energy industry or how hard it is to fight the um, healthcare industry or whatever. How hard is it going to be fi to fight the industry that realizes that success here would mean they no longer have any special advantage over anybody else? So, so you can be pessimistic or optimistic, but I, and I think, you know, we have no choice but to try to be at least 20% of your time optimistic about solving this problem. Uh, I'm Jules Sigel from Microsoft, but I was also before Microsoft at the Copyright Office and one of the principal authors of the Copyright Office recommendation. So if anyone's Whoa. brain is dead, it's, <laughs> if, any, if anyone's brain is dead, it's mine. So I, I offer that uh, caveat. So you may not want to listen to what I have to say, but I just want to make a point about the question of um, orphan works legislation and, and, a, and a relatively simple one, which is, and it's a quibble. It's just a quibble that I think it's a false choice between registries and the legislation that was proposed. And if you read the report and the, the, the idea behind the legislation by creating a standard for reasonably diligent search, which I know you've criticized as being a lawyer's friend and something that's really not workable on a scalable, on a scalable level, it, is, it was designed to create an umbrella under which we could develop registries on a voluntary basis, sector by sector, things that were tailored to the appropriate uh, creative endeavor, whether it be books or whether it be documentary films, whether it be, uh, you know, photographs, images, uh, because, and it wasn't exclusive of registries. It said that's really what we have to do is get that information flowing, but let's do it in a bottoms up way as opposed to a top down way from Congress. It, that, that really was the plan to, to allow those things to develop. And while, it, and the, the somewhat ironic thing about why that, and this is what I'll talk about on the panel I'm on, which is, the public failure of not passing that legislation is, is because it wasn't hard enough in the minds of some rights holders, particularly photographers and visual artists, that it wasn't hard enough on users to find, uh, to find you know, to have to go to lengths to find owners. And, and, and it wasn't the fact that it was, you know, the fact the registry system would be even more of an anathema to the main opponents to reform in that area. But I do think, and I, and I think the, the hopeful forward looking point is that because it's something of a false choice as, as you presented it, there is actually hope from this settlement, as you've said, about the fact that you have two major rights holder constituencies who are now essentially saying they're okay with a very formalistic registration-based system. So let's see if we can take some of that movement and maybe work registration or other formalities back into a copyright system in a very sensible way that is uh, uh, supported by a broader consensus. Well. I will accept the uh, criticism that it's too simple to say that we either have a registry or we have um, the uh, brain dead solution. If you'll accept the criticism that it's too simple to say that we either have a top down solution or a bottom up solution. Because the proposal that people who have advanced the idea of registry as a solution to orphan works advanced is not that the government sets up the registry, it's the government sets up a set of requirements that basically uh, directly in, uh, incent incentivize the production of these bottom-up registries. Um, now, in your defense, you know, and, and I have enormous respect for the technicians inside of the Copyright Office as they implement 
policies that they don't get to set. In your defense, um, the solution that, uh, that's a registry solution requires two steps that the copyright religion or the, uh, or the politics of Washington won't allow anybody to consider. The first step is that we begin to convince IP um, scholars around the world that there's no requirement in Bern that formalities not be imposed upon domestic works. Right? Because, of course, we imposed formalities upon domestic works. Bern is about imposing formalities on foreign works. And the reason that creates a problem for policymakers is they can't imagine creating a requirement that applies only to Americans and not to foreigners. So they say we can't create a registration requirement. You know, the proposal we were pushing was something like uh, 14 years after publication, you've got to register. If you don't register, it's in the public domain. If you do register, you continue to get the benefits of copyright. Right? That's a simple solution. But under Byrne, it can only apply to domestic works. And that was politically an impossible step to take. And so given that's not a possible political step and you've got to create something else, I'm not sure I would have crafted exactly like what you crafted, but I understand why you crafted it the way you did. So this brain dead is not a criticism of the, exec the lawyers who are executing the commands from the politicians. Brain dead is a description of the politicians, right? So, um, so I'm, uh, I, I, I just reject the idea that we can't architect a better, more efficient system that relaxes the constraints on whether we can impose formalities on our own and then to start using our power to get other countries to do the same, just like we use our power to get other countries to adopt TRIPS plus solutions to, to copyright uh, solutions. But I agree with you. The ultimate solution has got to be a solution where there's a competition of registries to facilitate um, uh, uh, low cost and minimize any market power here. You know, confess a bias, uh, confess a conflict here. Uh, Creative Commons is actively in the business of trying to facilitate exactly that architecture. And open, we won't have any exclusive control over it, but um, that's exactly what we want to facilitate. And if it turns out that this law gets passed and it creates the right incentives to push towards registries, then I'll be happy to be proven wrong about that. But it seems to me what it does in the interim is encourage the creation of enormous morass of headaches that doesn't solve the wholesale digitization problem. It might solve the, I'm a particular researcher and I need to get access to this book problem, but that doesn't seem to me to be the real, that at least in my view wasn't the real problem, but I apologize if I was a little bit harsh in the way that I characterized this, this solution. So with great reluctance, let me <coughs> cut it off there only because we have our next session coming up which deals with what do you know of work and work. So we're going to segue right into that, take a minute or two break to get everybody up here. Larry, anyway, hoping you can maybe stick around and continue the conversation about work and works that we've just started now. And please join me in thanking Larry Dunson. For